I would make some hyperbolic statement about the desire to fly, but all I really have to say is when in Costa Rica, it is kind of obligatory to go zip lining. This tight connection between the rainforests of the country and this activity that lets you enter the usually hard to access rainforest canopy has been a brilliant piece of marketing. These cable suspended pulleys, first used by biologists to reach the high canopy, were subsequently turned into a tourist attraction with the goal to give people on vacation a unique perspective on the rainforest and raise awareness about its fragility while also providing money to communities in the rainforest not derived from cutting it down. That said, zip lines exist in a murky area between the appeal of nature and the appeal of adrenaline released during the ride. Some tours, like the one I went on, focused little on education and the environment, and more on the thrill, from Superman-style zip lines that dangle riders face down over the trees, or a large bungee cord swing that really bothered me as I do not like the sensation of falling at all. Gosh, it swings with the oscillations of falling people. It's a bridge to destiny. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Ah! Whoa! Swinging! Okay, this is good. <laughs> In this video, my goal is to go over the good, the bad, and the ugly of tourism in the environment, and how to make it better. Tourism is big business, with sometimes an upward of a billion tourists going on vacation in a single year putting well over a trillion dollars into the global economy. Most are headed for Europe for some reason. Not sure why. There are many forms of tourism, including some specifically focused on experiencing nature. On holiday, I would consider myself generally an eco-tourist, someone who wants to experience the natural world and visit remote areas where nature dominates and disturb it as little as possible. The goal generally is to find interesting life forms, gain some sort of education on the organisms and the place, and get a perspective on how humanity impacts the natural world. In a few minutes, I will explain why this view is a bit of an oxymoron, but before I get into the negatives and start ranting, let's look at the positives. Ecotourism has real benefits for nature and the communities nearby. A study conducted on the Osa Peninsula of Costa Rica found that ecotourism here generally contributed to the local economy, with tourism workers more likely to be locals than not, and have much more disposable income than people working in other fields like agriculture, fishing, or construction. And tourism workers felt like the opportunities afforded by tourism helped them financially progress. Because these locals now have disposable incomes, small businesses can flourish in the nearby communities, meaning much of the local economy in the region is ultimately reliant on tourism. This economic growth helps alleviate the greatest driver of habitat destruction, hunting, and other activities that harm biodiversity, poverty. Tourism also directly benefits the jewel of the Osa Peninsula, Corcovado National Park, by paying entrance fees, which for those who have never gone to this place, the Osa Peninsula is very rugged and very difficult to access. So having tour guides providing boats or leading multi-day backpacks into the wilderness probably has really increased the flow of money to the preserve. Many eco-lodges exist just outside the park that maintain their own forests that connect directly with the national park, giving wildlife more space. The locals who make money from ecotourism also appear to be more conscientious about environmental issues facing the region. You see a similar phenomenon in the Monteverde region of Costa Rica, where one wildlife preserve has led to the creation of more, and now the whole mountainside caters to ecotourists and is generally protected as forest. Part of the secret of ecotourism as a conservation strategy is you can sell the same animals and plants over and over again to different tourists, instead of either killing it or capturing it for the pet trade and just getting one payout per creature. The same for natural landscapes, where you could mine it and destroy surrounding habitat, or sell the same rock formations over and over to different tourists. So, if ecotourism has so many positive attributes, what are the downsides? 
First off, the local communities don't always reap the rewards like in OSA. Often, foreign investors make the bulk of the money, though it is possible like in OSA that this will ultimately lead to locals starting their own competing businesses. There is also a long history of locals being evicted from their lands when preserves are set up. Sometimes, small communities are forcibly evicted and not properly compensated or moved to less ideal areas. When Yellowstone National Park was established, it is thought some 26 different tribes lived on the land, but during the establishment of the park, they were removed. In Kenya and Tanzania, the Maasai lost access to many of their grazing lands, and have generally been treated unfairly by the ecotourism industry. Then comes the elephant in the room. Tourism requires travel and is responsible for 8% of greenhouse gas emissions. This creates a bit of an oxymoron. Ecotourism is technically a non-essential activity, and so the emissions from it are seemingly for frivolous ends. Tourist traffic also creates local pollution, and communities have to find a way to collect and dispose of garbage and human waste, and need far larger facilities to deal with these issues than they would if it was just the locals. In Monteverde, the tourist industry uses much more water than all of the locals combined, and as the towns here are built into the side of the mountains, all of the trash has to be taken several hours down a road to a landfill. Sometimes, very unusual kinds of pollution can affect special ecosystems. For example, Carlsbad Caverns are a vast cave system and ecosystem, but the presence of tourists wearing normal clothing has caused lint pollution that is hidden in the darkness. But if you happen to shine a light on a dark cave wall, you will see how extensive the issue is. While ecotourism is the fastest growing tourism sector, its presence may lead to other tourists descending upon the area. While ecotourists value things like pristine nature, other tourists may value comfort or excitement. One of the issues facing the Osa Peninsula is the development of more mass tourist resorts, which are common elsewhere in Costa Rica, but don't generally maintain their own protected forests, and wouldn't push people to go into Corcovado National Park. The presence of people also alters the behavior of wildlife. Lots of foot traffic has clearly been shown to drive animals out of an area, People may also feed animals, leading to animals that will approach people looking for handouts and end up lacking fear and then they might bite people. In most U.S. national parks I have visited, there are always some sort of ground squirrel hanging around looking for people to drop food or feed them. While most national parks disapprove of this and have penalties for intentionally feeding wildlife, people continue to feed animals illegally. Sometimes, though, the way the tourism is conducted changes the animal behavior. Off the Kona coast of Hawaii's Big Island, manta ray night dives are incredible experiences where artificial lights draw in plankton clouds that bring in manta rays. This obviously has changed the natural behavior of these intelligent sea creatures, probably altering where manta rays occur in the area. Not to mention, with all the traffic, some people touch the rays, though they are told not to, and this leaves unsightly rashes on the undersides of these great fish. So for those who don't know, I am from Utah, which happens to be a tourist destination, primarily focused on the Wasatch Front where I grew up, and the Colorado Plateau where I have now been spending considerable time as a part-time resident. The Wasatch are some of the most recreated places in the United States, both by locals like me, but also tourists, both in the summer for hiking, rock climbing, and the summer wildflowers, but also in winter with the thriving world-class ski industry. I am acutely aware of how crowded it is, and it can be difficult to even find parking to use these highly trafficked areas. Then comes places like around Moab and other parts of the Colorado Plateau in the southern part of the state, which I can only describe as insane. So, if you have heard of Utah, likely you see images like this of a formation known as Delicate Arch. Images like this, though, are not representative of visiting the area. Usually, the parking lot is full, and getting a nice image can be difficult because of all the selfie takers trying to get the perfect Instagram image that just stand in the middle of the arch, with a whole line of people waiting just a few yards away. I mean, this crowd formed on a weekday, it was raining, and there was a global pandemic. Like, who are all these people? By the way, if you don't follow me on Instagram, you should at jjackson underscore biology, 
Generally, I post images of nature against black or white backgrounds, but also sometimes some images from adventures I go on. Oh, here is a parking lot like eight miles down a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, full of people from all over the US trying to get into a flooded slot canyon. How many cars are there? They're from everywhere, and this is like in the middle of nowhere. On a Wednesday. These areas are now all over-trafficked nightmares. The traffic can also do some real damage. There once was this secret archaeological site in such a neat area that professional photographers came to get stunning images. But the secret got out online, and pretty soon people started lighting fires in the middle of it. This forced the National Park Service to close the site down, though it appears the little rope is not enough to stop every would-be photographer. However, I definitely think that its closure has driven down foot traffic, which is a good thing for the local wildlife. So, how do we make ecotourism better and make good on the promise to make tourism sustainable and beneficial to local communities and culture? Understanding what the goals are in both terms of conservation and economic growth is perhaps the first key to success. The development then needs to be closely monitored and regulated by scientists and local governments, with accreditation through NGOs likely being another step to maintain best practices and to give out guidelines. Local control is essential to avoid ecotourism becoming a new form of imperialism and protect local communities and cultures from becoming some kind of twisted tourism commodity. However, in some places, foreign investors are needed to jumpstart the industry, but locals need to control who they want to work with. It is important that ecotourism starts at a small scale and then grows slowly so it doesn't get out of hand. For example, the rapid and uncontrolled tourism growth in Moab, Utah has created a negative view of tourism development in other small Utah towns that don't want to become the next Moab. When it comes to actual wildlife conservation, perhaps the best approach is to have intensive tourism concentrated in a small area. The world-famous Monteverde Cloud Forest Preserve is insanely crowded by tourists, but the trails through the forest only give access to a tiny part of the preserve, so wildlife can flourish without human interference a few yards off trail. These sacrificial hardened areas give people a taste of a pristine ecosystem, but keep them from inadvertently damaging it by their presence. Another important step is making sure the tourists actually care, thus the importance of local guides and spreading a set of rules when it comes to sharing these places online. I feel fortunate to have entered pristine ecosystems or found a hidden gem in nature, but the best practice when sharing these experiences is to leave out the details to keep the place from becoming overcrowded like so many other spots because they're not hardened for the amount of traffic they could receive, and the traffic will change the ecology of the region. My personal philosophy is to be very cagey about the locations of particular experiences outside well-established trails, and I am really reluctant to share exactly where I find animals. If I mention it, then it is either well-established or difficult enough to reach that you will need to hire a local tour guide to even get there. 09, the year that we decided to destroy cultural artifacts. Thank you for watching this video. I ask that you share this particular video to try and get this information on how to make ecotourism better out there. Have you had some cool ecotourism experiences? Are you a local in a place famous for ecotourism and have your own thoughts on the industry? I would love to hear about that in the comments section below. This video is part of an ongoing Fundamentals of Conservation Biology series with a new episode coming out once a month. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and ring the bell so you will be reminded when the next episode in this series comes out.